Metaphysics is a, is a science of reality, of all being. Other sciences we're familiar with, such as math, science, chemistry, um, they deal with what is material, what is seen. But metaphysics deals also with what is immaterial, what is beyond reality, beyond what is seen, but what is real, such as the spiritual realm. The child, not being weighed down by what is material, um, readily makes that leap from what is material to what is immaterial, from the physical to the metaphysical world. And it is thus that the child more readily grasps these deep mysteries and actually bridges the gap between what is seen and what is unseen, which we often call faith. Okay, it was um, our second to the last day of school, and one of the children came in and said to me, tomorrow's our last day, and, and I said, yes, I'm, I'm going to miss you. And he said, I'm going to miss you too, sister. And as we were speaking, another child ran past us, headed towards the chapel, and he exclaimed, I'm going to miss Jesus, as he ran to go visit Jesus in the chapel. A couple of years ago, my children were preparing to receive the Sacrament of First Communion. I took them over to the church so that they could get a tour of the sacristy and all of the items used at Mass um, by the priest, by Father. They absolutely loved seeing all the sacred vessels and the vestments. And Father showed them all of the beautiful vestments used for benediction, and they just oohed and awed over all of it. And then he pulled out the books that were used in the Mass and showed them the Roman Missal and the lectionary. And then the children saw another book up on the shelf and they asked him what that was. So Father pulled it down and he showed them the Book of Blessings. And he flipped through it and he said, there's a blessing for um, married couples, there's a blessing for your pets, there's a blessing for rosaries and religious articles, all different kinds of blessings the priest can give. And then he turned the page and said, oh, there's a blessing for children, too. And one of the boys just screamed out, bless us, Father, bless us. And so he did. He stopped what he was doing, and he gave the children a blessing. My family was visiting the mother house a couple of years ago, and my niece was around five years old. We were outside visiting the grounds, and we have a cemetery. And at the cemetery, there's an altar and a crucifix, a statue of Mary, um, and some other beautiful statues there, lots of flowers also. And Lisa told me, um, Sister, I want to look for a place to talk to Jesus in my heart room. And I said to her, what's your heart room? And she said, it's that place where it's just me and Jesus, just the two of us there, nobody else. And I said, oh, well, that would be lovely to find a place where you can talk to Jesus in your heart room. So we walked down, and there was the altar there with the crucifix, and there were two little angels. And she sat down by one of the angels, and she said, this would be a good spot to talk to Jesus in my heart room. And then she just folded her hands and put her head down. Okay, I'm done. And then she moved on. It was just so precious. Maria Montessori recognized the dignity of the human person during her time, the child was seen as a mini-adult. In her observations, she noticed the real nature of the child, a love for work, the ability to concentrate all day long, the desire to please, and more. By meeting the needs of the moment, the teacher prepares the child for the next moment. Therefore, the task of the teacher is to understand the child's development, and prepare the environment and lessons that best serve the child. Maria Montessori was an expert medical doctor and an educator, as well as a Catholic. As an expert medical doctor and educator, Maria Montessori observed children for many years. In her observations of children, she developed four planes of development. Another word for planes 
or stages. These are the four planes of development. The first one is ages zero to six, or birth to six. The second one is ages six to 12. The third, ages 12 to 18. And the fourth, ages 18 to 24. She noticed that children or, and young adults every six years go through periodic changes, and that's where she got her idea of these planes. She also noticed that within those six years, she divided the planes into subplanes, into two periods. The first three years of each plane is a time of intense growth, much change, kind of peaking after that third year, the middle of the plane. And then it stabilizes a little bit for the last three years of each plane. She also noticed that the first and third planes parallel each other, and the second and the fourth planes parallel each other. The first and the third planes tend to be times of um, instability, huge physical growth, if you think about the young child, zero to six, especially those first three years, how much growth goes on. And then the teenager, a lot, a lot of growth between ages 12 and 18. And it also tends to be a time of psychological and emotional instability during those um, two planes. Whereas the second and the fourth planes tend to be times of more stable physical growth and more stable emotional and psychological growth as well. Another helpful contribution of Maria Montessori was her discovery of the sensitive periods in a child's life. As a medical doctor, she did much study of science. She studied a scientist that researched these little worms, and I drew one here on the poster. <laughs> the mother worm lays her eggs in a, in a dark spot in a corner of a tree, usually under some leaves. And the little worm, when it comes out of its egg, has to move towards the light in order to get its food. So the little worm has a sensitivity toward light, which only lasts at the beginning of its life so that it can get food. And then that sensitivity goes away. Maria Montessori noticed that sort of sensitivity in children. Sensitive periods are times in a child's life when he or she is most receptive, capable, or responsive, or susceptible to receive some type of learning. So just like that little worm was receptive to the light, a child goes through periods when it is most receptive to some type of learning. She called these windows of opportunity for us. They are brief times, intensely compelling and transitory. It's irresistible to the child. What, whatever they're interested in, whatever that learning is, is irresistible. There's just a great love for it. And it's transitory. It, it doesn't last forever. The child is not conscious of this inner drive to learn. It's just something in them that is driving them forward. Children universally experience the sensitive periods. They can overlap within the planes. You will see that some sensitive periods are, are specific to planes, but some sensitive periods cross over into other planes. The sensitive periods also help a child to adapt. It helps them to feel at home and secure in their family or their environment. Because of the uniqueness of this first plane of development, Maria Montessori called it the absorbent mind. If you think of that word absorb, think of a sponge, how it just takes everything in. Whatever, whatever it, it soaks up, just soaks up things. Maria Montessori named this period the absorbent mind for children ages zero to six because they tend to just soak up whatever is in their environment, and whatever they are exposed to. Some of the characteristics of this period are as follows. 
the child learns effortlessly. And she called this ability to learn without any effort the secret of childhood because there's such a joy to their learning. They're, they're so happy. They take things in. They want to share things. And they haven't really put forth any effort to learn it. It's all just their nature at that age. They easily adapt to their family and their home, to their culture. Every little baby miraculously learns the language of their culture where they're born. No matter where they are, they always, within a year or two, take on the language of their, their culture, which is just a miracle of God. The child at this age also explores through their senses. They have to see things, touch things, feel things. They're constantly moving. You will notice that um, in this child, they have to use their senses to learn. There are great and fast physical changes. You can imagine how large and heavy we would be if we grew at the rate that we grew our first year or two of life. We would be um, hilarious <laughs> to see. The child grows so quickly in those first six years, but particularly those first two or three years of life. The child at this age has a need for order. This isn't just um, to have things their way. It's actually part of their being. They need to be able to orient themselves to the places where they are. And so when something is in a particular place, it gives them a sense of inner order. It actually helps them internally to or organize their own selves, their um, thinking, and even their emotions. Their basic individual personality is formed. You can see this in young children already. Um, even in infancy, their personality is coming out. The child in the absorbent mind period mostly asks the question, what? They want to name things, and they want to know the names of things, and they want to know what things are. The hand is the primary instrument of the mind for this age. Whatever they put in their hands is what's going to go into their mind. Just telling them isn't going to work. They need to touch it and to experience it. Repetition is extremely important for this age child. They repeat and they love to do things over and over. You'll watch the child button and unbutton the shirt or open and close drawers over and over and over and it can drive adults crazy but it's fulfilling the inner need of the child at this time to repeat. The child also incarnates his or her experiences. Children often take on the walk or the smile of their family. Um, they have similar characteristics to, do, to those they are exposed to, and that's part of incarnating their experiences. So this is the first plane of development, the absorbent mind. It's important for us to reflect and to know these planes of development or these sensitivities of the child in instruction because often as adults we want to impose on the child where we are, where we're coming from at this point of being a human being as an adult. And so we will find ourselves sometimes frustrated with the child and frustrating the child. Um, one example I often think of is um, we're so goal-oriented as adults. We want to finish the task. And a child is not goal-oriented. They are process-oriented. I remember at the beginning of the year, I have the children washing dishes, because we have dishes in the classroom. And um, they finished washing their dishes, and then they went and got the clean ones off the shelf and washed <laughs> them also. And I just had to laugh, because I knew they didn't care about having clean dishes. They just enjoyed the process of washing dishes. So it's important for us not to rush a child and to let them keep going through the process as many times as they need because something inside of them is being developed, something inside of them is being satisfied during that process. Another area that is important is the need for order, which you know, Sister had mentioned. Um, Maria Montessori, as a scientist, you know, she's and actually a Thomist, truthfully, she noted that 
the world is created and there's order in creation. You know, I know Fibonacci, you know, he talked about how in his own study of creation, he noted that there's a pattern of numbers in creation. And Thomas Aquinas also noted this. And so Maria Montessori, taking that in, said the classroom needs to be a mini cosmos, that in the classroom we need to create an atmosphere which reflects creation, which is that there is beauty and that there is order. And so at the beginning of the year when I'm setting up my classroom, I make it a point to really make sure I have everything exactly where I want it to be. Because if I leave something out um, or in the wrong place, for the rest of the year, the children will put it there. This year, I reflect upon it, and I had this little black stand that I accidentally put in the windowsill until the last day of school, every day, I would move that black stand to where I wanted it. And one of the children would put it in the window where they found it the very first day of school. The sensitive periods of the absorbent mind. If you notice, there's quite a list of the sensitive periods for the first plane of development. This is because the child so easily absorbs and so easily learns in this first plane. Here are some of the sensitive periods in this, in this first plane. The time of birth, that's a sensitive period. The, a sensitive period for sounds, and that begins in utero and goes on to age three. Um, I remember hearing about the birth of my niece, and as soon as she was coming out in the delivery room, she turned to my brother who was speaking, so that the young child can recognize sounds and they need to hear sounds in order to be able to eventually speak. There's a sensitive period for bonding with their mother from utero to six weeks. There's a sensitive period for weaning from six, around six to eight months, and a sign for that is the development of teeth in the child. You'll see children with a sensitivity towards small objects. They will notice things that we would never notice and pick up teeny tiny things. And this sensitive period is usually around age two. There's a sensitive period for toilet training, which usually occurs right after the child can walk. Order is another important sensitive period. As we talked about before, the child um, needs order to build their inner order. There's a sensitive period for movement that begins in utero and uh, goes until age three, and then it's refined from ages three to six. So obviously there are huge changes from zero, from utero to three, as the child learns to hold their head up, then learns to sit up, learns to crawl, um, it learns how to lean on furniture and stand up, and then eventually learning how to walk and to run. So huge developments of movement there. Language begins in utero and goes to age three, where the child first listens. You'll see the young baby watching the mouths of adults closely, and then eventually starting to form their own sounds, moving on to words and sentences so that by age three there's usually an explosion of words and um, quite hundreds of hundreds of words in their vocabulary. There's also a sensitive period for the refinement of the senses and this starts at birth and goes on to about age three. And I remember a time um, when a little girl was experiencing snow for the first time and she was only a little over one years old she went out in the snow and just stood there because she didn't know what to think of it. And then I showed her how to make a snowball, how to build a snowman, how we could throw it. And then all she wanted to do was touch it, put it in her mouth, start to look to see what it was like to walk. Um, but it was going in her mouth a lot. And you'll see that as the child is refining their senses. They put a lot of things in their mouths. They touch things often that they shouldn't touch just because they're, they're learning and they're so curious. Finally, there's a sensitive period for social relations that usually goes along with movement and language as the child learns how to greet another and move towards a person, 
um, you will see them start to interact with other people. Those are the sensitive periods for the first plane of development, the absorbent mind. During the first plane of development, the absorbent mind, the child is receiving language, you know, they're listening. They're actually listening when they're in utero to all the voices around them and they're somehow processing that within themselves. And so it's important during this time, even beyond from three to six, that we choose our words when we're working with children, that we don't just go on and on explaining what we want to say. The child, um, Marie Montessori had it in part of her instruction, is she would just name the object. No explanation, just name the object with the article. And so it's important for us as religious educators to do likewise when we're talking about um, the, the articles at Mass, the, the priest vestments, or whatever we have that we're teaching the child that we just name it for the child so we don't get caught up in the definition, what it's used for. Um, and otherwise, even with the faith, it's difficult for us not to get caught up with going on about ex expounding on what we want to teach the child. We need to trust that what the Holy Spirit has given to us in the words of Scripture or in the prayers of the liturgy, they are sufficient. Simply to read the Scriptures to the child is sufficient. Simply to present the child the words at Mass is sufficient with no explanation. Just present it to them as it is given to us through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> After Jesus rose from the dead, the apostles were with him for 40 days. He walked with them, he spoke to them. They wanted them to know that he is still alive <coughs> in a glorified body. And then after 40 days, he left them and he ascended to his Father in heaven. They made a promise to them I will be with you until the end of the days. And they also said, I will send you the Holy Spirit, and He will teach you everything that I taught you. And He will remind you of everything that I've said. So don't be afraid. Because were they afraid? No, no. Were they afraid? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they what did they do? Lock the door. They lock the door. They give themselves away. So we're going to be celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. So let's listen to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, it found them gathered in one place. Suddenly, from up in the sky, there was a noise like a strong, driving wind, which was heard all through the house where they were seated. Tongues as of fire appeared, which parted and came to rest on each of them. All were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to express themselves in different languages and make bold proclamations as the Spirit prompted them. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And one gift they received, is, he said, is a gift of tongues. But today, boys and girls, we're going to ask to receive one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts. Our light and the the gift of wisdom. To love as God loves and to see as God sees. Understanding 
to know God in a deeper way. The gift of knowledge, to know the truths and the mystery of God. The gift of piety, the gift of prayer, of listening to the voice of God. The gift of counsel, to know the right thing to do and to teach others the right thing to do. The gift of fear of the Lord, of awe and wonder, to know that he alone is all powerful. In the gift of fortitude, the gift to have a strong mind and a strong body. children, it's, it's just wonderful when you go outside with them because they're captivated by the things of nature that God has prepared for them as they, they see it. They'll run up with every rock is unique to them. They take home book bags full of rocks because every rock is, is, is special. They find something in it that's just unique. And you know, when you're out there, they'll just like exclaim when there's a hawk flying over or a butterfly. And they almost can't, it's irresistible to them to not respond to the beauty that the Lord has prepared for them. And in this, you just see that a child is just drawn to what is divine, to what is, as we were talking, metaphysical. They take it beyond the physical to the metaphysical immediately. You know, there's no in-between. And um, an example is that this is a child that I taught, um, Jed. Jed was, is a, was a difficult child. He. I don't know, he, he was a loner. Um, he would get angry quickly. But in the classroom, I had flower arranging. And every day, Jed would come in and he would do flower arranging or he would polish the leaves of the flowers. He just loved to do those delicate tasks. I would go into the chapel and find it flooded with flower arrangements by Jed. Um, and his mother had relayed to me, as I was relaying to her, his love of flowers, which she had seen at home once. They were outside um, in the backyard and as usual Jed went off by himself and she watched him walk over to the zinnias which were growing. She said they were about his height and he put, picked one of the flowers and put it between his fingers and just gently looked at it and she could tell that he was smiling and then he leaned over and he kissed it. You'll notice several significant changes as the child moves into the second plane. They no longer have that effortless absorption of their learning. It becomes a chore to learn. They have to work at it. It's not so much a joy or a pleasure. Work isn't um, as fun for this age child. And you'll also see a great increase in their social interests. They become much more concerned with their peers in the second plane. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the young child, the child between the ages of 6 to 12. Unlike the first plane child who learns through their senses and has to touch and taste, smell everything, this child starts to move into the ability to reason and use their mind more rational thinking. They have a great power in their mind without having to use their senses as much. It's a period of greater stability. They have lots of energy and exploration through their imagination and reason. You'll notice the herd instinct. They want to bond with their peers, where the young child, young children, play side by side, and they do, as they get older, start to play together. These children love to be together. They want to have clubs. This is where they join scouts or um, a lot of sports teams, and they can really work together and learn from each other in that way. 
they worship heroes and really look up mm -hmm. to others, which is a great time to introduce the saints to them. They love to learn about people. They want to imitate them. It's the dawn of morality and their conscience. Um, the church calls it the age of reason, and it's fitting that it's at this time period when the child learns and prepares for the sacrament of reconciliation. We can help, um, help them because they have some problems. Usually they start to become argumentative at this age, convincing, wanting to get their own way. And we, we can really help them to form their conscience um, through studying the Beatitudes, the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. and such, um, giving them good examples in the saints. The child loves challenges. They can be very competitive with each other and with themselves at this time. They are capable of abstract thinking where the young child needs materials to form their intelligence. This child is able to put away those materials and, and learn simply through their mind. And you, uh, I've seen that in a classroom with, especially with math, as the young child needs a lot of materials, things for adding, subtracting, and such, um, acting things out. The older the child gets, the more they can just do it with their paper and pencil or in their, in their own minds. They work without their hands. Instead of being interested in just what something is and learning the names, simply, this child wants to know why and how, why something is, the reasons um, behind something, and how it works. It's very, very fun. While the young child wants to repeat the same thing over and over and over, for example, the, the first plain child might fold a whole stack of napkins, you know, at home and carry them across the room because they love movement too. And then heap them in a pile, fold them again, carry them across the room, and repeat that same action over and over and over. The second plain child will repeat, but they'll repeat with some sort of creativity. For example, this year my class did a little Mother's Day sewing project of a pin cushion. And I originally cut two pieces of flower-shaped felt for them to sew along the edge, stuff it, and finish it for their mothers. They absolutely loved sewing, to my surprise. Girls and boys both loved this sewing project, and they're asking me for more, more sewing. So I decided to bring some more felt in, and I just cut large squares and decided I would let them do as, as they would like. Where the young child would want to do exactly the same thing, the children, 6 to 12, mine were 7 and 8 at, for this project, they wanted to design their own thing. Some of them made squares, some of them made little pillows, some of them wanted to sew a button on, some knew somebody who was graduating and wanted to sew it into, wanted black felt so he could sew it into a graduation hat and put a button and a little tassel hanging off. So they will repeat with um, creativity. They'll want to do something to make it their own. Finally, this period is the end of childhood. The, they're not so cute and cuddly as when they were young. They're moving toward independence, um, which you will see in the third plane as they want to be um, further away from their parents. So this is, these are the characteristics of the young child of the second plane of development. Just like there were several sensitive periods for the first plane of development, there are sensitive periods in our second plane of development, but they are fewer. The first plane child just so readily absorbs and takes things in. The second plane child doesn't have that nature, so there are sort of there are less sensitivities at this time, but nonetheless there are several. One of them is gregariousness and group functioning. This child loves to be with with groups and with each other, and they work and they learn well um, from each other. They will share information, um, and so learning, learning with groups and not just on their own is one of the, their sensitivities at this time. Just like in the first plane, there was a sensitive period for language, but it was more 
the basic formation of language. In this second plane of development, there is also a sensitivity for language, but it's more for the structure of words. And word etymology kind of goes with their interest in where things come from. Uh, where, where do those words come from? And word order, this is when um, they're capable of higher levels of grammar and sentences and writing paragraphs and such. Also, this is the, s they, this time, they have a sense of morality and justice, which also needs our formation as educators. They will have difficulties um, interacting with each other that needs um, help in helping them work out situations with each other. Um, they start to get into situations with peers where they might get in trouble and they don't know what to do. They want to do what's right, but they want to please their friends too, and they, they have that uh, sense of their conscience, and they need our assistance in making right decisions at this time. They do have a good sense of justice as well, what is right and what is wrong seems very clear um, to this child, uh, the child of this age, too. Finally, they have a sensitivity towards finding relationships, and that's be either between objects, between topics of study, between people. They love making connections to things, and they love researching topics further. They will have an interest, and they'll want to learn more and more and more about it and read all kinds of books about it and report to everybody about it um, at this age. So these are some of the sensitive periods that you will notice in the 6 to 12 year old child. Perfect. We have all been working on our mass boxes and Laura Catherine brought hers today and she's going to show us the priest. Laura Catherine, can you hold that up so that all the children can see your priest finish? Is it good? Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Give it to Andrew Yeah. Can I hold your priest? Thank you. He has all of his vestments on. Does anyone remember what this vestment is called? Samantha? I think it's the That's a different the one. Owl. The alb. Yes, this is the alb. What is this vestment called? Sydney? Stole. The stole. And this one's a little tricky. Do you know the name of this vestment on the outside? Danielle? The chasuble. The chasuble, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Laura, sure. Catherine, you may put your priest back in your box. Xavier, can I have your assistant up here? <coughs> Xavier is going to be our priest. What is the first vestment he's going to put on? <laughs> Ava? The stole? No, not the stole. The owl, that's right. Ready? <laughs> So is that what the priest actually wears? Yes. It's yeah. a smaller version of what the priest wears. Uh, <laughs> it's just that I wonder if they're going to get all preservers. So you wear that all day? No. <laughs> is it just a bed sheet? He's going to be so oh, no. a real owl. Yeah. It's huge. I've been to her. It's a little bit big. You can snap it in the front. Oh, it looks like a big nightgown. It has to be real small. Big leg. Maybe you can I can't see your hands, Aldi. There you go. It's a little big, but that'll do. He's got his alb on now, so it covers his street clothes. And alb comes from the Latin word that means white. And it's just like in heaven. Do you notice in the picture Jesus and Mary were wearing white? In heaven we will wear white garments to stand for our purity. Next, the priest puts on a, s a belt with a special name. I think I might have told you this name once or twice. Do you remember the name of the special belt the priest wears? Oh. 
is called a cincture. A cincture. Oh, yeah, you told us it was. Now, I don't know the special way the priest ties it, but I'm going to tie it a simple way. I think you tied it as a knot. Can you put your arms up? I know which way. <laughs> oh, you wasn't going to be Oh, you do a press a lot. That's what you do. Ask Father Basil to give you a lesson on how to tie the cincture. Ah! <laughs> it's a square. Great. Ava? Will there be any altar servers? We'll have to see. Yeah, I want to be an altar server. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, me too. You're done with the picture? Yeah. You can sit on the shelf up there. Wait, not everybody see this. Oh. Has everybody seen the picture? The stone! The stone! The stone. The stall, yes. Tiny. Usually it has a little cross up here and the priest kisses it before he puts it on because it's blessed. Kiss it, really? Kiss it. Kiss it. it does have the cross on it. But I'm blessed. Since he's a priest, it goes on both sides of his shoulders. What would it look like if he were a deacon? Oh, would it be a cross like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you make it look like a deacon stall? I might have to tie it. Yeah. I don't want to make it look like a deacon stone. Or crossed or something. Right. It would have to be, you so know, like along this side. I didn't know he if was If he were deacon. a deacon, it would be like that. No, he's but a we're pretending he's a priest because he's going to say mass. Then his pop will just say mass. cool. Now, from his vestments, ah. can you tell? What season of the church year we are in? With his vestments? Ava? Um, I think Easter. We're in the Easter season, so he's going to be wearing white for his trousers of all. Usually you wear gold for Easter season. Right, now, right there, Father. Okay. Good. Father, would you like to stand behind the altar? Father Poppy. Father Poppy. Father Poppy. Yeah, Father Poppy. Don't burn it. Don't. It's going to catch on fire. Definitely don't burn it. We need to get a few other things ready for Father. I'll just show you. I'm trying to get that to stay up. Did you hear the wine? That actually is weird. Is that real? Yeah. How sister yeah. is it drinking? Just, it's just pretend. Sister, is that real wine? Mm -hmm. Where is the hose? I don't know if it's real wine. Is that, is that real wine? Mm -hmm. I have some cruets over here for us. Okay. So we won't be eating those cruets, but thank you. Yes. See now, I think we did some work in our classroom about how to set up the chalice. I'm going to move the finger bowl so that we have a little bit more room. And I'm going to take the canes off the chalice. I'm going to ask Ian, since you're in the front, can you sit all the way down flat? All the way down. Okay. I mean, sit. Sit all the way. Just oh, don't oh, sit on your feet. Oh, oh. Perfect, perfect. That way the others can still see. When we're setting the chalice for the priest, what goes first? Henry? It's that little cardboard part with um the, that goes right on top to keep the bugs and stuff out of it. Do you mean the palm? Yes. Thank you, Ian. The pole will go on it, but it's not going to be first. Yeah? Is it the little, um, the, I forgot what it's called. The <gasps> Danielle? Could it be the pattern? Yes. Something goes before the pattern. I'll give you a hint. It's one of the cloths used at Mass. Samantha? Um, I think it's that cloth, but I don't remember what it's called. That cloth actually will be last. Sister. Jamie? The purificator? The purificator, yes. The purificator. Remember oh, the purificator has a little red cross 
Any cloth that touches Jesus' holy body and blood will have that red cross on it. So we're going to set it like that. cool. Now what's next? Paul? Not yet. Tazirin? The pattern. Joshua, can you come and put the pattern carefully on top of the chalice and the purificator? already has the host on it. So we don't have to add that. What is the bean on top of it? Say that again? Please. Oh, never mind. You mean the host? Mm-hmm. It's a big one because the priest uses the big one. Isabella? Is that for real? No, it's just made out of paper. Yeah. 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 <gasps> Danielle? Maybe the chalice veil? The chalice veil, yes. That's right, the chalice veil. Okay, uh, yeah, it's too big. 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 It stays kind of shaped like a triangle, like that when it's set up for mass. But ours is a little loose. Floppy. Yeah. Okay. Which cloth does Father need to unfold on the altar during the mass? I have two cloths left. Sydney? The left one. The one in your left hand. The one in my left hand? Wait, no, the one in your right hand. You were right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> what is this one called? Dove. It has a special name because the body of Christ lays on it. The purifier? That's the one on the chalice. Uh, is it the corporal? The corporal, yes. Um, Father, would you like to unfold the corporal into the big square on the altar? Step back off the rug. Which part of the mass do we kneel? Samantha, the part when Jesus is going to be consecrated when he says all the blessings. Yes. Yes. Let's practice that part of the miracle. Father, could you put the chalice on the altar? And you can carefully take off the chalice veil and put it back on the credence table. And you can put the pall on one corner of the altar. Is he actually going to pour that water in here? We're going to pretend like we already did that. Are we going to use that in there? Okay, and you can put the pattern and the chalice on the corporal. Mm-hmm. And you can take the purificator off. Oh, you're so quiet. <coughs> And you can hold up the house and we're going to practice these words. And let's practice kneeling since we're kneeling at this part of the house. 
Take this all of you and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And you put the pattern down. Let me turn it quick. Take this off you and drink it from it. For this is the chalice of my body or blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let's briefly take a look at the third and the fourth planes of development. The third plane of development is the adolescent, the child between the ages of 12 to 18, which we term the teenager. Maria Montessori noted some characteristics um, in teenagers. They have a sense of compassion for others. They're very idealistic. They're usually quite self-absorbed. Like the first plane child, they're working again on their inner life. And there are so many changes similar to the first plane, only they don't um, show as much as in the first plane. That it, it's a period of great stress and um, great change in the adolescent. But um, along with all of that, they're quite capable of leadership and service at this age. They want to be independent from their parents, but still kind of close to home. So it's, they're sort of at that in-between stage. And they're starting to be interested in politics and making the world a better place and contributing to the larger society. The main sensitive period for this plane of development, the third plane, is a sensitive period for building and creating society. So they're starting to really become integrated in the world, to get jobs, and start to make a difference in our society. The final plane of development is the fourth plane, which you see is um, ages 18 to 24, and which we term the young adult. The young adult's years are times of more security and self-knowledge. They're ready to give of themselves after that, those teenage years of kind of learning more about themselves and going inward, they're ready to go outward and um, live more selflessly. And part of that living selflessly is contributing to society through the taking on of their vocation, a, a job at this time, or um, marriage, family, um, religious life, the priesthood, whatever their calling is. So at this age, they really want to know their calling for life, and they have that special sensitivity to make huge life decisions. They're ready for that commitment. Often we sisters talk about um, the special grace to enter the convent and how that's sort of like a little window, a sensitive period um, in our own lives. And I think it's similar for the young adult, anyone who's getting married or starting their vocation, that there's sort of a special window of opportunity there special grace that, that comes in that period. So the main sensitive period then of this fourth plane is, does have to do with vocation or partnership, marriage, or um, accepting your vocation and, and starting it out. And those are the four planes of development as Maria Montessori observed them. Sophia Cavaletti states that for the child, love is more necessary than food. And in contact with God, the child finds the nourishment his being requires. Nourishment the child needs to grow in harmony. The capacity for the child to receive this love is evident in their sensitivities to both the physical and metaphysical world. These sensitivities to both the physical and metaphysical realities tend to bridge the gap we call faith. 
They are ripe for these deep mysteries, and most significantly the deepest mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation, which manifest God's being as love. This is readily grasped by the child and satisfies the child's greatest need. To deny them this because we believe it to be too profound is to deny them their nourishment. As an educator, I often wonder who is doing the instruction, me or the child. T.S. Eliot in his um, poetry, The Four Quartets, kind of poses the paradox in my beginning is my end. The child, who is so metaphysical, is close to the father's hand. And in their sensitivities to nature, that they don't have this, this bar barrier between what is physical and what is metaphysical. And so it seems that for each of us, as T.S. Eliot said, in my beginning is my end, that each of us should be striving to become, as our Lord said, as little children. We should be reaching back to those sensitive periods where we too are sensitive, that we don't have the barriers between what is physical and metaphysical, that as a child, they are one. Shepherd is called a sheep, and he wants to be with us in a particular way, in a particular place. Shepherd is with us in a special way. And in a special place. his sheep to be with him at Mass. He calls them by name.
Mass, Jesus is present with us in the form of bread, see him as a statue or a picture. We see him in the form of the bread and the wine. And he is present with us in the bread and the wine. So we don't need this, do we? Because Jesus is with us in the form of bread and wine. special work and says special words. We call him the priest. The priest has special work. He uses Jesus' words that Jesus gave to us at the Last Supper when he wanted to be with us. He wanted to stay with us and to feed us. So during the Mass, the priest prays over the bread and the wine, and he says, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. Then he says a prayer over the wine, and he says, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is my blood. Those are kind of strange words, aren't they? But it's Jesus' way of saying he wants to give us all of himself, all of me. He wants to be with us, and he wants to give us all of himself 
his body, his blood, his soul, and divinity.